So when it comes to power, probably your mind first goes to your legs or your hips or your trunk rotation. And all of those things are extremely important, but they are dwarfed by something simpler, hitting the ball in the center of the string bed. So, you know, as you coordinate your kinetic chain better and better, you might get 10, 20, 30, 40% more power. But there's a way you can get 20%, 30%, 40% more power overnight, and it's hitting the ball here instead of here. Now, I'll show you the energy return with my particular string bed. So if I'm bouncing this in the center, see how high that's going. Now, if I bounce it with the same amount of force on the edges, this is the same, see, I'll go back to the center. It's the same, using the same amount of force. And on my racket, the energy return looks to be about half. So this is gonna vary with your strings. You can do various things to try to make that sweet spot bigger. But generally speaking, the energy return of here compared to here is gonna be around 50% less, maybe 30%, maybe 70% with some setups, maybe 20% if you try to make a really forgiving setup, but you're always gonna hit much, much slower out of here than right out of here. And now this has really important implications for your goal of trying to hit harder. You could do everything right. You get this to fire, you get this to fire, your chest fires, you, everything comes through, you're moving through the court. And then if you hit here, instead of here, you've just undone everything that you just did and you probably hit the ball at the same speed. Versus if you're, you know, hit it kind of casually, you know, half speed, but you hit it right out of here, that's the same velocity. So that's where we have to start our talk about power today because we are gonna get to some of those downstream or upstream things that create velocity later, but it is all subordinate to contact point. Because if you don't hit the ball at the center, you pay around a 50% power tax right off the bat. And so the first things we'll be going through in this video are have to do with your feet and your eyes and probing the ball so that you can hit that first primary goal, hitting the ball on the center of the string bed and everything else comes after. The most important parts of your body for hitting hard are your eyes and your feet. And then in order to use them effectively, you need to know where your swing ends up in space. So you have to uncover through exploration, through trial and error, how you feel most comfortable hitting the ball. Now, a tool I really like for this is the weight. For me, and for a lot of the, the players that I've worked with, when you use something heavier than the racket, it really lets you feel the spots through the air where you're most comfortable generating force. So when I use this, this is two and a half pounds, you know, a little over one kilogram. When I use this instead of the racket, it's very light. And so now, you know, for me, like this height, this distance, I just feel so much strength through here. And I can feel, oh, out there is not as good. Oh, in there is not as good. Down here is not as good. This gives such great feedback so I can feel that and I can learn for my body where that perfect spot is. And I'm looking for it as I do this so that now I can try to find the ball in that exact spot where the weight is teaching me that the racket flies through effortlessly. And it gives you intuition, so now I'm aware when the ball is not there. So it's twofold awareness training. Number one is trying to figure out exactly where in space that is effortless. Right? So why did I move my feet right there? It wasn't verbal. I wasn't thinking, move here, move here, set this up. I had a visual memory, a movie that plays in my mind. And it's trained on things like this and if I trial and error while playing, that just knows that if I find that ball here, it's just gonna smack it cross court. And so it's just pure visual connection plus habits that get that to happen. And then it's the exact same thing where because that's so comfortable, I immediately know when the ball's not where I wanted it as it's coming in, because it doesn't match what I'm expecting. So that's the first thing. Um, with the trial and error piece, right? A lot of this, you're just gonna learn on court. So as balls come, I have like a mental image of what I want to happen. And when it doesn't happen, it's just my brain subconscious just goes, hmm, that didn't work. And so the more I practice these kinds of situations, the more I get a sense for exactly where in space works for me. Now the key here is intent. As the ball comes in, you must have intent for what you want to do. So like there, I was visualizing that cross court snap, slap shot. Like that's what I wanted to do. 
the reason that the intent, the movie that plays in your head, like very briefly as the shot comes in, the reason it's so important is that way, when this happens instead, now you have something to compare it to. It's like, this is how you learn your perfect spot. It's like, huh, I felt really jammed and restricted there. That's a sensation that I now, you kind of map to that visual experience. And, and it kind of, again, this is mostly is happening intuitively, non-verbally, but the point is without intent, it doesn't happen. So a lot of times I see this where, it's like all I really kind of did there was vaguely watch the ball and then just kind of vaguely try to hit it versus like having a real intent for the exact relative position between my body and the ball that I wanted. So as the ball comes in, as the ball comes in, there's a very visceral kind of kinesthetic movie that, that, that is this, that I'm trying to match onto reality. And without that, power doesn't happen because all of this can't connect to the ball here. So continuing our theme that the feet and the eyes are the most important part of attacking slow balls because they get you to hit the center of the racket, we call this probing. And probing is the act of setting up the shot that you want using your feet and your eyes. So I'm gonna feed this ball right at Alexa's chest. Now all of those movements around the ball, it's not just like vaguely setting up for a forehand. What that is, is finding the contact that she wants that she knows is going to work. Now do a couple where your feet get stuck, where you're not really paying attention, you don't really split step, and all of a sudden, a slow ball like this, you can't hit it hard. Like she could swing hard, she'd probably miss it. So the fir very first thing with probing is that the more the early reaction, the better you can do. All right, go back to like alert, because the same exact ball speed, she has enough time to set up her perfect shot versus not. Now the second thing about this is ball height. It is much more difficult to pick the ball up at your knees than not. So back up one or two steps. So when I give like kind of a short-ish ball, hit this one for real. So much of that execution, it looks easy, but she's making it easy for herself. These aren't nearly as trivial as she's making them look. The reason they look easy is that she's attacking the ball and getting it as high as she possibly can in order to make the ultimate stroke she has to execute easier. So we'll show you a demo here. Now don't attack the ball, just wait for it. And you're gonna see these shots all of a sudden, these same exact feeds. That's a very difficult approach shot. And that's pro this is probably a situation you, find, you guys find yourself in a lot where you're like, man, these low approach shots, they're so difficult. But all you have to do, okay, you can explode again. All you have to do on the stat feed is just sprint up to it and all of a sudden the degree of difficulty goes way down. When we think of power, like I gotta twist, I gotta do this, all that is good, but it's all subordinate to the actual physics of what's happening. The physics of hitting in the center and just the geometry of the ball and the net. The difference between playing this ball at your knees and taking that same ball and getting it, you know, I'm feeding these pretty low and she's still getting it right around the net tape. Now the second thing is, let's say I'm back here. So I'm your opponent at the baseline. Power is not really what matters. What matters is how much time I have. So another thing that Alexa's doing, as far as competitively, when she sprints up to the ball like this with early recognition, you know, we, we think of power, like it's great when it sounds cool off the racket, but really what you're trying to do is hit the ball past your opponent. So when she sprints up and she attacks the ball like this, it's like the ball is past me before I even know what happens. Now she could hit that same ball but now don't sprint up and now hit it from back there. And now it's like, I have plenty of time to get over there because her ball has to travel so much more distance. So again, everything you're doing with power, it's subordinate to physics and geometry. When she comes in four or five feet, her ball is like effectively so much faster, right? Because that ball is being struck five feet in front of me and I have literally I don't know the time, at least half a second less, maybe a full second less to react. Okay, so now try to hit that same speed without moving up. She's probably gonna have to hit the ball like twice as hard without moving up. Well, that's the same thing. It just gets low and then it's almost impossible. I'll try to feed a little deeper. So it's like, you know, even though she hit that ball really hard, it's in front of me, I see it bounce, everything's easy because it just spends so much longer in the air. So there's really two reasons 
that exploding up to the ball is so effective. Two geometric reasons, there's the height and the distance. And so a lot of times if you're playing somebody, like we just made a video on center, it feels like he plays in 2x feet, but it's both things. Number one, he hits fast, but number two, he hits early, right? He's playing against Ben Shelton and he's hitting the ball here versus a guy hitting it here. So it's a fast shot and it's covering less distance. And so again, like we all think we're going for power and we are, but really what we're going for is taking time away from the opponent. And so everything we do for power is subordinate to these physics and the geometry of the court. So now that we've established that the center of your string bed, the physics and the geometry of the court are the most important parts of power. Now let's get into the more traditional, how do you swing the racket faster? One of the most important ways is leaning through the court, positive balance, getting your weight through the court, which recruits all the strong muscular musculature in your legs into your shot. So what Alexa's got rigged up to her here, it's an elastic band attached to the back fence here. So what this is going to do is any motion she does, whether it's twisting, whether it's driving forward this way is resisted by the band. Just turn this way so we can see it real quick. Now the hip line here is going to be where you're going to get the best kinesthetic feedback. You can do it on the stomach, uh, but, but it doesn't resist your hip twist quite as well. Whereas when you put it, like kind of sit on the crease of your hips right here, all of this musculature, which is what you're trying to recruit, gets really, really resisted by the band, which then helps you engage it more as you swing. Now, uh, if you're doing this, you can just drop feed yourself balls and it works basically just as well. I'm, I'm gonna feed them here for convenience. As you hit with this, it's gonna be a little weird. Your timing is going to be a little different because you're resisted by the band. So don't worry too much if you hit the net one or two times or if you spray one or two shots. Um, the, the, you're used to your body at your regular weight, unresisted. Really what you just want is to really just see the ball, hit the ball and explore that feeling of that forward momentum, the twisting momentum, the leaning momentum, everything that gets you going forward through the shot. All right, so take it off. Now, when you take it off, again, your timing is going to feel a little weird because now you are just kind of tuning your body to that resisted feeling and now you're not resisted. But what it's going to do is all of those feelings that you were just experimenting with, now it's all firing unresisted. And so again, it might take you a little while to actually like, oh man, I have so much power now. How do I actually control this? But you're going to find that these feelings which you're trying to unlock in your body of how to actually get force in that forward direction, they're going to be a lot easier to unlock practicing resisted like this and then taking that resistance off. So in addition to leaning in, everything going forward, which you know is really important for velocity, there's also twisting, right? Rotation is the main engine of our stroke. And a lot of times what I see from uh, a lot of players that I work with as they come up for shorter balls is they, they see a shorter ball, but they don't actually turn sideways. Now, the reason that I made that shot is because I understand if I don't turn sideways, I'm kind of just hitting a control shot. I can kind of block the ball where I want it. But if I were to try to, oh, I'm going to attack this ball. <sighs> the problem is if you don't turn sideways to prepare, but then you rotate forward through your shot, you just over rotate. You either hit it wide or you shank it. So what we need is watch my upper body. Even if I'm running forward, I have to wind the upper body sideways if I want to rotate into the shot. So as the ball comes in, that coiling, again, even if your hips are forward, even if you're running forward, the upper body turning is the only way it can unturn. Now again, this is what I usually see, same intent, but oh, but I forgot to coil the upper body. So then when I tried to twist it back, instead of twisting from here to where I wanted it, it started from here, you know, slightly turned to here. Now, if you're hitting something like a server turn, then this kind of a shot, boom, very small rotation, completely fine. So it's not that there's a right or a wrong answer here. It's that your preparation must match your intention. So if your intention is to use rotation to power your swing, you have to get that upper part torqued against your hips. If you don't, and then you try to use rotation to power your swing, it's not really going to work. If you hit it cleanly, you'll probably hit it wide. You can maybe try to like sag the wrist, but you know, really it's get in that habit, feel, feel that left arm pull the trunk against the hips if you want to twist it in your swing. And if you don't want to twist it in your swing, that's really fine. You can even still be aggressive. Just take the ball as early as you possibly can and don't try to rotate into it a ton. Just use your positive balance and use your direction. You just have to make sure it matches. Now, the final piece to this power puzzle 
is rotational velocity. The reason rotation is such an effective tool is you can do it in a very small amount of distance and time. So positive balance is awesome, but it takes a lot of distance to make it work. You need space between you and the ball to press into it. With rotation, you really don't. You know, if we watch our last video, we did center swing. And watching on slow-mo, it's like seven frames to get from here to here and generate all of this power out into the hand. You know, one of the things we see when we study the forehand is that the trunk's angular velocity coordinates very, very tightly to the racket's angular velocity. In other words, the faster you can twist, the faster you can swing, generally speaking. So if I'm kind of at warm-up speed, almost everything I'm doing is basically the same as when I hit full speed. It's just that this is kind of a very relaxed, controlled, not super intense rotation from the trunk. And now if I want to change this into more of a rally speed, all I do is I wait slightly longer for the ball, of course, because now my swing is shorter. And this is almost the exact same feeling from the rest of the body, but I'm just rotating slightly harder. And I know you might like kind of hear the ball or see the shot to be like, that's slightly harder. But that's the thing that's a beauty about the trunk is it is only slightly harder. My subjective level of effort between those two shots, th this, this shot, it's like a one out of 10 effort or a two out of 10. And this shot, it's like a five out of 10. If I do a 10 out of 10, I probably can't even control, I can't even control really the racket in the air at a 10 out of 10. So this is another thing with tennis is like your goal is to find efficiency so that that five, six out of 10 effort level where you still have kind of full awareness of where all your limbs are ending up works. Now, we have a lot of resources to try to help you feel this corkscrew between your hips and your, your trunk to try to help you use the shoulder slant and the side bend to hit that lower contact without having to arm the ball up like this and to be able to fire through using that same kinetic chain. It's tricky. It's tricky to get the hip involved. It's tricky to connect it here. We got a lot of other videos. We got one on the abdominal corkscrew. We've got one on imagining X through your abdomen and using those stretches to help you feel it. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you're hitting the center, you're using the geometry, you're using positive balance. If you want to dial your shots up and down, rotate more or less hard. One more time, again, same exact fundamentals, but I just don't really rotate versus a quick a rotational pulse, quick, simple rotational pulse turns that swing into a rally ball.